I'd like to do now is just look at a few passages of the scripture to sort of back up everything we've been talking about. Again, this is going to be brief. These are just snapshots. These are the starter thoughts that get you thinking in ways you want to keep thinking long after this session is over. So let's go back for a moment to the upper room. Remember what Jesus said there in John chapter 14. He said that he would give us another friend to help us to be with us forever. He said, I will not leave you like children who don't have parents. I will come to you and you will know that you, now the you here is plural, that you are in me and I am in you. And then along that line, he prayed for the same thing. When in John 17, there in the upper room, he prayed, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known to them in order that I myself may be in them. But the climax of his prayer is when he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you in me. He said, I make them one by putting my glory in them. What does that mean? Well, glory comes from the Hebrew word uh, kabod, which means the opposite of ephemeral or dazzling. Rather, when we talk about the glory of God, it refers to that which is weighty and significant and substantive, concrete, tangible, something very real. What the Puritans called, as we saw in session one, the manifesting of the presence of Christ. So when Jesus says, I have put my glory in them so that I may be in them and you in me. Jesus gives us God's glory because he is God's glory, full of grace and truth. To encounter Jesus is to encounter the outward manifestations of the true character and nature and instincts, the passions and purposefulness and dignity, the righteousness and holiness and love and saving power of the living God. This is the glory of Jesus that he manifests to us in our midst by the Spirit of God. And it is this glory, the undeniable reality of his indwelling, pervasive, substantive involvement within us that makes us one. I mean, we cannot be otherwise. Furthermore, he who unites us together promises to continue gathering us together with increasingly weightier, more intensified, and more tangible experiences of his visible presence, and to keep doing that for all ages to come. He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. So it's going to go on. The glory you've given me, again, that I myself may be in them. This is our destiny. There are two metaphors used in the New Testament that talks about this concept of Christ in the midst of his people. One is referring to the Old Testament temple and the other is referring to the human body. Let's look at both very quickly. First, in terms of the Old Testament temple, that now it's a temple that's not made of stone. It's a temple made up of people in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Sort of the same idea of Peter in 1 Peter 2 when he says, As you come to him, he's talking about Jesus, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Paul talks about the temple concept in 1 Corinthians 3. He talks about how what he's building has one foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ, and that we've got to be careful how we build on it. And then he asks, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives in you? And then he goes on and he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, because God's temple is holy and you are that temple. He's saying that God's people gather together with Jesus as the foundation and Jesus in the midst is so holy that anybody that tampers with that or divides it or in any way dismantles it has only one thing to look forward to, and that's the judgments of the Lord. 
The other metaphor that's often used in the New Testament is that of the human body with the head in control of the body. Speaking the truth in love, Paul says, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, Paul says, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The Bible says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, that's the way it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit, into that one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given this one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, when you take a drink of water, it gets inside of you. It's within you. The Bible says that we've been pulled together as a body under one head, Jesus Christ, and we're drinking the Spirit, and that's how the the living Lord Jesus carries out His reign in the midst of His people. The Bible also says God has appointed Him, that is Jesus, the universal and supreme head of the church, a head that's exercised throughout the church, the church which is his body, the body that is the fullness of him who who fills all in all. For in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. In other words, we're a microcosm of the coming macrocosm when Jesus will visibly fill the entire universe. Even now, he wants to fill his people with the fullness of himself with the reality of himself in our midst. And so we come back again to the principle, Christ within me and Christ within us, it has to unfold together. But what he accomplishes in me is derived primarily from what he does, first of all, among us, we who are his temple, we who are his body, because it takes the full body of Christ to enjoy the fullness of the love of Christ because it takes the full body of Christ to grow in the fullness of the life of Christ because it takes the full body of Christ to manifest the fullness of the reign of Christ. Let me review that with you. It takes the full body of Christ to enjoy the fullness of the love of Christ. It takes the full body of Christ to grow in the fullness of the life of Christ. It takes the full body of Christ to manifest the fullness of the reign of Christ. That's why Paul says, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this great mystery. This is the heart, the core of the gospel, that this sovereign reigning Lord Jesus, he wants to be in the midst of his people, taking them on into all the glorious things to come.